good evening and it's a great delight to see you all here this evening. My name is Natalie MacDonald and I'm the Vice President of Development at La Trobe University and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening and pay our respects to their elders past and present and also to acknowledge and welcome any Indigenous people in the room this evening. On behalf of the University, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to our sold out Ideas and Society event tonight, the unfinished feminist revolution, hashtag me too, and the forgotten women. And I've been reminded over the last um, couple of days, I've been uh, in Sydney doing some work for the University and um, it's, it's, I've had cause to reflect on how important it is for us to be uh, promoting debate and discussion about important societal issues and the trends that we've seen to try and shut down debate on societal issues, whatever they are, are quite um, disturbing, not just in this country but, um, but in others. And La Trobe University takes these matters very seriously and it's um, fabulous under the leadership of La Trobe University's Vice-Chancellor's Fellow, Professor Robert Mann, that ideas and society continues to be one of the most thought-provoking and important forums that we have for discussion of ideas. There isn't anything else like it in the country and we're very proud to have um, been sponsoring such, uh, such events and will continue to do so to ensure that we're having the opportunity for debate on issues that are of importance to us all. This year's program has taken a closer look at A Better Australia with speakers including Tim Costello and Connie Lennenberg who spoke on Australia's internal obligations. Professor Gillian Triggs and Julian Burnside on human rights. Noel Pearson and Megan Davies on the current state of Indigenous affairs. Kevin Rudd and Terry Moran on Australia's politics. Tim Flannery and Robin Eckersley on climate change. And the program will continue next month as we take a closer look at social justice with Cassandra Goldie and Frank Brennan. Tonight's event will be no exception to these fabulous opportunities to discuss key issues. The third wave of the great but still incomplete feminist revolution began half a century ago. Last year, a new frontier erupted spontaneously. Global-wide and driven by social media, the hashtag MeToo movement targeted the predatory sexual behaviour of men, especially, but not only, the rich and famous, towards the cultures of Western nations towards which the cultures of Western nations had for so long turned a blind eye. At the same time, some feminists turned their attention to another equally pressing but all too often overlooked question, the precarious situation of older single women. Among non-Indigenous Australians, it is this group that sits uncomfortably at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And I will say, um, from my own personal perspective, before I joined the university, I was the Director General of Housing in Queensland, and this group of single older women was the most disadvantaged through every community in, the, in, uh, in Queensland, and it was a very distressing matter to have to be dealing with. Tonight, we will hear from two of our most independent, courageous and compassionate social critics. Jane Caro is a Walkley Award-winning Australian columnist, author, novelist, broadcaster, advertising writer, documentary maker, feminist and social commentator. She has published 12 books, including three novels, Just a Girl, Just a Queen and Just Flesh and Blood, a trilogy on Elizabeth Tudor and a memoir on Plain Speaking Jane. She created and edited Unbreakable, which features stories women writers had never told before and was published just before the Harvey Weinstein revelations. The Women Who Changed Everything her book on the life story of women over 50, published by Melbourne University Press, will be launched at the end of this year. Anne Mann is one of Australia's most penetrating cultural critics. A former columnist for The Australian and The Age, she now writes longer essays, such as the cover piece in the May edition of the monthly this year, Great Domestic Hoax, How the Economy Free Rides on Women's Unpaid Work. Her books include Motherhood, a Walkley finalist, a quarterly essay, Love and Money, a memoir, So This Is Life, and the best-selling The Life of I, The New Culture of Narcissism. She is now writing a new book on child sexual abuse. Her chapter, The Quest for Social Justice for Mothers, is just out in a new book, Dangerous Ideas About Mothers, edited by Camilla Nelson and Rachel Robertson. Jane and Anne will talk to us for about 60 minutes and then we'll have some time for Q&A with the audience. 
but for now I will leave you in their very capable hands to discuss this very important topic, the unfeminist, unfinished feminist revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jane and Anne. So, Jane, just before the Me Too movement broke last year, in August, you published a book, Unbreakable, mm. a collection of stories about uh, women's stories of survival, including survival of sexual assault. Can you say a bit about uh, your conception of the book and what you were hoping to achieve by it? Yeah, it's funny because um, maybe there was something in the air. Um, I had my own Me Too experience. Who in this audience has had a Me Too experience? Put your hand up. Yeah. That's what you always get. Yeah, it was, for those in the front, it was just about everybody. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd had my own Me Too experience many years ago when I was in my, I think I was in my early 20s. Oh, yeah, they wouldn't believe me because I can't remember how old I was when it happened. Obviously, I'm lying. Um, and I uh, don't remember what day of the week it was. Don't remember what time of year. I uh, must be lying. Um, so, uh, it was with the doctor having an IUD fitted. And it was funny because, you know, here I am, very outspoken. But uh, I never spoke of it. I never told anyone, ever. What had happened. And every time I thought about it, I'd go absolutely hot with shame. So I tried not to think about it. And then it just started to nag at the back of my brain. And I started to think, maybe I should do something about this. And I started talking to a whole lot of women. And then there was an incident at a book club where we were discussing, it was a long time ago, The First Stone by Helen Garner. And instead of discussing the book, everyone just talked about what had happened to them. And it made me think, well, maybe I'm not alone in this. Maybe we need to talk more about this. So um, I pitched the idea to UQP. They jumped on it. And I, it, usually when I pitch an idea for a book and somebody says, yeah, I'm really thrilled, this time I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and um, then I had to send letters out to people saying, would you like to contribute, which was also hard to do. And I asked them, I didn't tell them what to write, I asked them to tell the story they'd never told anyone before. And all the stories but one were about sexual humiliation. Not, some were horrendous criminal acts of sexual abuse, violent and, and really hard to read. Some were minor moments of humiliation or, or, or um, sexualised interaction that were just deeply uncomfortable for the person involved. But it was fascinating to me that all but one were about that. And then it came out in August and then, of course, the whole Me Too thing struck literally a month later in September. Mm. And Karen Goldsworthy, who's one of the contributors, sent me a, an email and said, oh, my God, you're a fortune... You know, you, you have this amazing ability. I went... Ugh. I doubt it. Maybe we're just getting to that point in this movement where we're all thinking along the same lines. I think one of the things Me Too has done, which is really important for women, is we often think of ourselves as the only weird one. Have you ever had that feeling about yourself? I'm the only weird one. And actually what it's turning out is, nah, we're all completely weird, but in the same way. Mm. Or that uh, sexual harassment, unwanted sexual contact, sexual assault is appallingly common. And that so many women, uh, the, a kind of uh, consciousness which is quite different from men, mm. uh, is that we have the experience of being prey. Yeah. I was struck by the beginning of your book, Tan Tanya Plibersek, mm. one of the most powerful women in the land, saying that she too <laughs> uh, uh, worries about walking home, has been assaulted on the way home, uh, uh, looks in the back seat and then she has to uh, warn her uh, daughters about how to behave. and. Uh, regrets doing it as well. Mm. So it's the, one of the really extraordinary aspects of Me Too, one of the really powerful parts of it, has been uh, this uh, collective expression 
uh, of uh, what it is to suffer from sexual assault. And we're beginning to just look around and, as the uh, audience show just how ubiquitous um, it is. Mm. One thing I was going to ask you, Jane, because it's also, you know, that at the centre of Me Too is overcoming the shame of admitting um, sexual assault. Why is it that women feel shame? Why did you feel shame, do you think, and kept silent about it for so long? After all, it was the doctor who was the perpetrator. Uh, I, I've thought about this a lot because I couldn't get to grips with it. But I think now that my theory about why women take on the shame is because we're kind of groomed from an early age to be sexual police. So not only sexual prey, but also sexual police. We're meant to be able to sort of control. Um, and it's often seen, you know, we hear a lot about, oh, yes, but where were you and how many drinks did you have and what were you wearing? And well, I was at a doctor's office having an IUD fitted. I don't know how you usually do that. Um, <laughs> And uh, so there's this tendency to, to, to put the, the blame on the woman anyway. But I also think that actually one of the reasons we take on the blame is an attempt to hang on to a sense of control. I think that rather than simply say, we are all vulnerable, life is chancy, there's nothing special about me, you know, I can come up against someone who's predatory just like anyone else. We prefer to maintain our illusion that we are in control of what happens to us by saying, well, obviously, I must have done something to cause that man to behave in that way to me because that's an easier concept for us to take on board than the idea that, in fact, we are in a world where bad things can happen regardless of who you are. And it took me... Um, 40 years probably and a lot of crises happening in my life before I finally clocked that life was chancy and I wasn't in control of what happened to me and I could be a really good person, I could exercise regularly and I could never allow anything with a pesticide to cross my lips and terrible things could still happen to me and I would still invent eventually die. Um, and I think we still grasp desperately for this idea that we're in control of what happens to us. So the weird, toxic side of that is to take on the shame if something bad happens to us. That's my potted theory for what it's worth. Isn't it also the case that uh, the society, the judicial system, that the culture tends to uh, disbelieve women? Oh, yes. And that the perpetrator's words seem to have a greater weight. So her testimony can be discounted. I was struck, for example, in about uh, Nina Funnell's story, uh, which was a horrendous attack where she was simply walking home to her mm. parents' house in Hunters Hill in Sydney. She was uh, attacked from behind, dragged off the street into a park, and the man was screaming at her, he was going to kill her as well as... Um, attempting to rape her. Uh, and uh, first of all, she froze. Uh, and that's a very common experience. Almost all the women in the book say they, they froze. froze. Right. So I actually think this is really important to think about because new research has just come out showing, um, and it's a Swedish study, of 300 women who came to a sexual assault clinic um, uh, within a month. So they were carefully looking at those, not where reconstructed memories, but very mm -hmm. fresh memories. And of them, 70% experienced what they called um, involuntary paralysis. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just, like, we talk about freezing, but actually it's more than that. It, what these uh, women were, felt they were unable to have a voice, to voice. Mm -hmm. They were unable to scream. They were unable to move. Uh, and they found that for those who had this tonic uh, immobility, as they called it, or involuntary paralysis, uh, something that is, if you like, a new um, neuroscience of, of sexual assault that is coming forward to explain something that juries and judicial systems have stumbled over, and more than stumbled over, they've actually uh, completely misrepresented women's behaviour. Because often it is asked, why didn't you resist? when in fact now we have scientific evidence that it's an extremely common response. So what's the response about? It's about the brain, probably over evolution. We've all seen perhaps a bird in a cat's mouth. 
of shutting down uh, and of, um, as Nina Fun in her case, not only shutting down and becoming immobile in order to avoid further arousing the predator, mm. uh, but also um, so giving you a chance of survival um, and not arousing their anger further. Uh, but also um, disassociation happens, mm. <clears throat> which means that uh, Nina Funnel um, found herself it, on this oval with a man over the top of her trying to rape her, screaming he was going to kill her. She found not only that was she fr freezing, but that her mind began to float off to a time when she'd been with her brother mm. and the, her brother had um, been playing sport there. He was an older brother and he was kind enough to let her eat the oranges with the team. So, that, so all of this is happening in a mm. space of probably a, a few moments. And then she snaps out of it and says, I will kill you. Mm. And the, um, the situation changes and um, she's able to fight enough to, to get back. And of course we know that that can't always be possible. But So here we have um, something that's really important because even today, in 2018, uh, defence lawyers will use whether or not you've resisted, whether there's evidence of your resisting, mm. what the bruises were, what the um, nature of the vaginal injuries were, or anal injuries, or whatever the injuries are, so that we have something that seems to be um, affecting uh, the majority of women, but uh, in the case of sexual assault, but at the same time, um, our law is way behind it. And also, I think you're um, explaining a lot of why women feel shame because they internalise the idea that they should have fought back and resisted and so they feel terrible that they froze naturally to try and minimise the harm that was done to them. And it isn't just women. I've just done um, two doc two little, uh, a little two-part documentary with Compass called Upside of Shame and we did the women's experience of shame in the first episode and men's in the second. And there was a, a man in that uh, who ended up total... Like, he, he was 15, walking home from a party, and he and his friend were attacked by two people, two bigger men, with a, a pruning shear... You know, hedging shears and a baseball bat. And he, in his alarm, stepped back from his friend and tripped over a low fence and l was lying in the garden. And he heard his friend being horribly attacked by these two people. And he described exactly the same response. He froze, he couldn't move, he couldn't speak, he was so terrified. And his shame was overwhelming. He said everyone was disgusted with him. He was a coward. He had mm. let this happen to his friend. So it seems to be a kind of universal human response to just go into this frozen state when something terrifying occurs. But we, um, we then take on another layer of shame for doing it. I think there's a natural shame too of being without power. Yes. There's something about powerlessness itself that makes you feel ashamed of yourself, um, belittled and all of that. Um, you remind me talking about the whole situation of the need to have, you know, that it's used in court cases, the terrible um, case which some of you may have seen. It was, I think it was on Four Corners not that long ago about um, Saxon Mullins who went to the... Um, bar early in the morning, had had a few drinks and uh, the young man who was acquitted um, took her off into it. Well, he invited her to the VIP area and then he took her to a back alley and they tried to say that she was happy to go. Well, if he'd known she was happy to go, why didn't he say, I'm taking you to a back alley to um, fuck you up the arse. Are you happy with that? He didn't. He said, I'm taking you to the VIP area. So he was trying to deceive her. And yet he was acquitted and everyone said, oh, he thought she was consenting. That just does my head in. How, how, if, why did he lie to her if he thought she was consenting? How does that work? How, what do we think of women? That we accept that a young girl, never had sex before, would, ex would acquiesce to that kind of thing and say, yeah, I'm up for that. Mm. I mean, some might, but why did he have to lie if he thought she'd be up for it? But yet... It was actually that. anal rape. Yeah. Um, and uh, the injuries were so severe that uh, the uh, examining doctor couldn't 
uh, examine her. But the reason the man was acquitted was that the um, defence was that, and the judge accepted this in a, a pe mm. an appeal, that what was in his mind was her consent. So that actually held sway. So what was in his mind? Now I have to just intercede here about mm. what was in his mind because in the course of my book on narcissism, a chapter that interestingly amongst all the chapters was the least talked about, which interested me, but it's called Others Exist For Me and mm. it's about sexual abuse, sexual um, uh, assault and rape. And in it, it's clear that uh, men who are more narcissistic um, and who, are, uh, who buy into more um, patriarchal um, thinking but also into rape myths um, are more likely to commit sexual aggression. But also um, men ha uh, have, it, it, who are more narcissistic have quite extreme cognitive distortions about women's behaviour. Right. If you go all the way through to um, a rape with violence, just to give you one example, a uh, rapist who was convicted who had raped a woman after tying her up uh, and um, gagging her believed that she had consented while she was still tied up. And case after case after case, you see these extreme self-serving uh, cognitive distortions. So. In this very recent case in the New South Wales, we are having a judge accept the idea that he thinks she's, he's, uh, the woman is consenting. She actually said when he got her in the lane and not the VIP lounge, no. Mm. So she, she, she tried to resist. And then my surmise is um, that she uh, froze. Yeah. So. So tell me what your feelings after publishing this book and then seeing this sudden uh, movement uh, and the tsunami of cases which were coming forward and women suddenly speaking in one mm. voice. Well, to be honest, astonishment, but also delight. Um, it did feel like suddenly an entire gender had thrown off a weight of, um, of undeserved shame and of and had gone from feeling disempowered and depressed and, um, you know, very self-critical about what had happened to accessing anger. And I'm sorry to be delighted that women are angry, but I am delighted because anger is energising, anger is powerful and anger is protective. It's a protective emotion because when you get angry, you're really drawing a boundary. You're saying, that is as much as I'm prepared to take. So I felt that going from this feeling of, oh, you know, I'm so ashamed, I must never tell anyone, I've got to keep it a secret, to, you know, basically, I'm, I'm mad as hell and I'm going to tell everyone, was a much, a really positive development. The other thing I felt strongly was that secrecy, keeping it quiet, makes the world safer for perpetrators. Because if perpetrators are aware that women won't tell, then that makes it a pretty safe thing to indulge yourself if you're that way inclined. However, now perpetrators, those who would be perpetrators or have been perpetrators in the past, are on notice that it's much riskier now. So speaking up makes the world safer for the vulnerable. And that delighted me that we had acted. And it delighted me for two reasons, not just because it makes women safer, but I've got a two and a half year old grandson who's the light of my life. He's an absolute joy and delight. And I looked at him and I thought, I don't want you to grow up in a world where you are tacitly encouraged to become a predator or to turn a blind eye. Because it's one thing to have, I've got a granddaughter as well, it's one thing to have you know, a daughter or granddaughter um, become a victim of this kind of thing. But can you imagine how it would feel to be the parent of someone who behaved like that? So I like the idea that we've actually put men and boys on notice that this behaviour is not acceptable um, and made it harder. So what about the claim in the wake of the 
um, Brett Kavanaugh case from Donald Trump that America is now a place unsafe for young men uh, because they're going to be accused and are being accused willy uh, nilly. So I mean, to I, speak. I, yes, so to speak. Uh, I guess one of the things about the Kavanaugh case, which um, uh, ended in the end so badly for a very um, brave woman, Christine Blasey Ford. For all women, given what I think yeah. Kavanaugh's going to end up doing. So, w with that particular case, because it was refracted through the Republicans and the Democrats, it got caught up in the whole kind of tribalism. Um, it's, it, I think it's worth bringing forward that those who supported Kavanaugh, the conservative side of politics, raised something which many people worry about and think about which is if the accusations are going to be made in social media, what about what we call due process and what about the presumption of innocence mm. until proven guilty? I just want to say a little bit more about the Kavanaugh case mm. and to indicate that I don't think that um, because he was confirmed that we had due process. And I think because of that uh, highly political situation, uh, what happened was they were really just looking, the Republicans, that is, for a means by which he could be exonerated to be confirmed. I don't think it was ever going to be the case that oh, um, no. her um, brave and very moving testimony was going to sway things. But what happened in the, the, this idea of the due process, which is not unimportant at all, no, and it's the, is a, um, the idea of innocence until proven guilty is at the centre mm. of our legal system, and has been for a very long time, mm. for very good reason, uh, that actually what was passed off as an investigation by the FBI mm. was actually organised by the Republican Attorney General with instructions from Trump that were not allowed to interview this person or that person. So it was set up not to corroborate. And then they said, Star surprise, Chamber. surprise, yes, it wasn't corroborated, her evidence wasn't mm. corroborated, which makes it sound as if she had lied mm -hmm. and then you had um, Trump going to middle America uh, to address a rally and saying well she couldn't remember um, and a cheer going up and a jeer and then she couldn't remember the street and she couldn't remember the time and so on. So sh she moved very quickly from being ca called a very fine woman by him to being someone who's now the poster girl for the lying accusations. In reality, uh, if we move from the Kavanaugh case to um, Australia, women are 44 more times more likely not to report oh, an attempted right. rape rather than report it. And the numbers of cases which are actually taken through successfully to conviction um, are tiny. tiny. They drop off at the committal hearing and they drop off in large numbers at the indictment. Um, and it is still possible, even with law reform, there's been a lot of efforts at law reform, it is still possible for a woman, as happened in 2014, to have pictures of her underwear being shown in the trial. And the fact that she was wearing pretty underwear meant that she was more likely. And someone who'd been raped um, uh, and uh, was um, uh, uh, traumatised by it was asked whether she was moaning with pleasure and so on. So there's still this extremely aggressive adversarial system. Uh, and then the person who was in that case acquitted, uh, he was um, shortly thereafter uh, accused and convicted of a rape. There's one more thing that we know through um, the uh, kind of data collection that is now occurring, and that is that it seems to be the case that often a predator is not only guilty of assaulting one woman, oh, yes, but, but that it happens that they have multiple uh, victims. So and it's extremely important to allow the kind of law reform, the kind of, um, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is all the palaver about due process, can we please have due process such that women's voices in the courtroom are actually heard in a fair um, and just way? Absolutely, and I think the thing is I, I, I'm a great believer in the principle of innocent until proven guilty, but it seems that in sexual assault cases, women are seen as guilty until proven innocent. Um, in other words, the assumption is that, that, that she's lying um, automatically. And it is incredibly problematic 
from my, from my point of view, I don't think Christine Blasey Ford would ever have gone out and tried to uh, accuse Kavanagh unless he'd been standing to, to serve on the Supreme Court. And she wasn't actually accusing him of criminal behaviour. I mean, it was borderline criminal, I suppose, what he did. It was assault, but it wasn't rape. You know, not that I want to get into the finer details of what is and what isn't. But it wasn't about a court case. It was about a job interview uh, for a pl uh, the highest judicial job in the land. So I my I imagine she felt it was her duty to come forward and say what she knew. And there were, of course, other women who also came forward with similar stories. Um, the thing about Donald Trump, I think, is that he is your narcissist... He's the narcissist par excellence. He's kind of like the king of narcissism. And um, he, he, it strikes me that the thing about Donald Trump... And unfortunately, I'm seeing it more and more, particularly on the far right of politics is what I call an epidemic of projection. So in other words, whenever Donald Trump makes an accusation, it's not an accusation, it's a confession. He's accusing others of doing what he himself is doing. Because Donald Trump has been um, accused of sexual predation by about at least 20 women. So when he says it's never been a scarier time to be a young man in America, he's really talking about what it's like for women in America, and particularly women who go anywhere near him, which I would recommend you don't do. Um, but I think <coughs> the Kavanaugh case has really writ large the difficulty that women face, and you've enumerated why that is. And I mean, I somewhat um, sceptically or cynically said, from now on, obviously all women have to go around with a notebook in which they make careful notes about everywhere they go, um, everyone they meet, the address, the day, you know, where it's... Because, of course, you never know when this is going to happen to you. And if you don't apparently have a full record of all the external circumstances, you will be not believed. And I think what the other layer of what Trump has done, what... Um, Kavanaugh has done, what the Republican Party has done, what some other high-profile cases, some of which are in Australia. There was one involving uh, the head of a, a major media organisation quite recently um, and uh, various other people. What that's all about is wanting women to shut up again. It's an attempt to make women go back to the days of silence. So, in other words, as women have spoken up, a whole lot of blokes who've behaved badly at various times have reeled back in horror and fear and they feel, OK, now we have to really start to get really super nasty now to make those women go back in their box and not talk about this. So I think that there is many layers of why what happened with Kavanaugh happened and a lot of it is political. They were determined to get Kavanaugh into the Supreme Court. I suspect to some extent... Trump's whole presidency is predicated on getting Kavanaugh into the Supreme Court because that means they rule for as long as Kavanaugh is alive, basically. Um, and they know Trump will probably fall by the wayside, let's hope, at the next election. Um, so there's a backlash. There's a backlash. There's a backlash. There's, and and Me Too seemed to be carrying so much before it, but we are now seeing the backlash. So with incredible speed, with a, it was it was like a show trial in a way. It was like a Kavanaugh show trial. case. Yeah, um, and the now, message was shut up, or we will eviscerate you. Yes. Now we have two really important elements to this program. So I know people are fascinated by Me Too, and there's a lot more we could say about it. But I want to now segue into the second part of the um, program, and uh, I want to do so by just referencing another sexual harassment case, which is very famous, and that of Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. Yes. Because there's this, a backstory to Clarence Thomas. Everyone probably knows here the, the story of um, the idea of Shakespeare's sister and who she was and what happened to her. Well, Clarence Thomas, who was accused of sexual harassment, had a sister, Emma May Martin. And uh, Emma May Martin, they um, were both orphaned um, as young people 
And so Clarence went to a wealthy uncle and then went on to go to York law school and do very well at Yale and um, on to eventually uh, the Supreme Court. But Emma May had um, three children. Uh, she went to a poorer aunt who she absolutely adored. The, um, the husband deserted her. Uh, then the um, aunt developed um, uh, Alzheimer's, had to be looked after. So she left work, um, she spent time on welfare. And in uh, 1980, Clarence Thomas made a speech to conservatives condemning his sister for being dependent and also that the children are all being taught to wait for a welfare check. So a prize winning um, journalist, Anne Crittenden, um, wrote this very interesting book called The Price of Motherhood, and she was an economics writer. So she went and interviewed Emma May Martin and discovered that the children actually were flourishing, that they'd all found that she'd spent some time on welfare but then had gone back to work when her, her aunt finally went into a nursing home, uh, that her life, in terms of its freedom to earn a living, had been constrained by care, that that care had helped people in her family to flourish. The children were all um, doing extremely well in either education or um, in paid work. So the story uh, was false and um, this single mother uh, had done an extraordinary job. Mm. So I think sort of both of us at the same time have been growing increasingly concerned about what happens to um, partly older women, but also single mothers. And I think it's, it's often not realised that at the very t same uh, moment that Julia Gillard wrote, uh, spoke such a brilliant speech on misogyny, um, she passed an act which pushed single mothers off the parenting payment, which allowed them to survive just um, if their child um, uh, had turned uh, six and they then had to, uh, to find work. And I don't think it's really understood exactly what poverty they were plunged into mm. um, by a wide uh, group of people. And the fact that um, increasing rates of homelessness, so that we have sort of on the one hand one young mothers, uh, but we also have um, older women who perhaps have left the workforce, just like Emma May Martin, to look after an elderly mm. father who has Alzheimer's, they have children, they have a checkered work history. Mm. So all of it happened at the same time as Australia made this great leap forward into neoliberalism. And I was really struck by Naomi Klein's book called This Changes Everything. Mm. She's talking about the problems of getting climate change, uh, ch climate change remedy when it's leave it to the market and um, the kind of policies you have where um, governments are not meant to, to interfere. And in this case, this changes everything, I think, uh, applies to the fact that at the same time as we had neoliberalism, the feminist movement was coming forward, also emphasising paid work. Mm. But people have been slow to realise that there's a different agenda going on. And that the one is about social justice and giving women more opportunities, mm. but the other is about things like demography, about things like uh, especially reducing the welfare roles and reducing, um, cutting tax for business and therefore you have to cut government expenditure. It's like a perfect storm. Basically, I'm, uh, I've just um, written that book which in my bio has the title it was going to have but it's now not going to have. It's called Accidental Feminists Now. And um, uh, this was came out of my concern about the fact that I came across this horrifying thing, which you probably all heard now, um, that the fastest growing group amongst the homeless is women over 55. And basically, the story, the typical story of why that occurs is that a woman um, of my, of our age, was brought up in one kind of generation as a child and young person, expecting that they would be looked after the way that women always had been. You'd work, you know, you did your schooling, you weren't necessarily encouraged to go on to university unless you had quite an unusual family when I was a girl because um, you were going to get married and have children so it was a bit of a waste of time really. You know, that's what women did. And so they didn't get high skills. They worked for a while, met some bloke, got married, had kids, meant to live happily ever after. Then, of course, the feminist revolution happened. Um, they started to be able to leave lousy marriages more easily 
perhaps did go into the workforce in part-time, low-paid, around children's hours, work. Um, then maybe there was a divorce. Um, until 2002, there was no superannuation splitting laws, so the man's superannuation was his. She was often left with um, maybe the house, custody of the kids. Um, then she works for a bit more than an ageing than aging parents, so she comes out of the workforce again to look after ageing parents. So by this time, there's very little super. She's got no savings. She's living week to week. Then the average age of retirement, retirement, I don't think necessarily it's voluntary most of the time for women, is 52. 52. Now, the old age pension doesn't kick in if you were born after the 1st of January 57, like me, until you're 67. Women over 50 have a terrible time getting another job. If they lose their job, they are the last people who are likely to be desirable in terms of uh, another uh, paying job. So what happens to them? Well, a lot of them sell the house because that's the only asset they've got. And of course, then they start living on the capital. They're on New Start, perhaps, which Tim Wilson on Q&A described helpfully in neoliberal terms as being not a hammock. Imagine letting people lie around on a hammock, but a trampoline. So it's kept deliberately low, you see, to work as an incentive to get people to leap off it into a new career, which might be arguable if you're a youngish person, not really arguable even then, but let's just give him the benefit of doubt for that. But if you're over 50 and you're female, if you're over 50 and you're male, but if you're over 50 and you're female, you, you're just leaping off that trampoline into thin air. There's nowhere to land. Um, and so you are living on the new start, which I think I'm really bad at remembering numbers, but if I'm correct, I think it's about $580 a fortnight. Anglicare did a, um, they do a snapshot every year where they look at rent, all the rental properties that are available are on one night in Australia, around the entire country. They did it, it's in March, I can't remember the exact date, but they did it in March 2018. They went around the entire country, looked at every rental property, and they were looking for rental properties that were affordable for people who were on New Start or Youth Allowance. And in the whole of Australia, they found three. Three. And we wonder why so many people are facing homelessness. Well, we've set it up so that they will. And what absolutely makes me irate, and it's the same as women taking on the burden and the shame of someone else's bad behaviour, is that the women of, who are finding themselves in this situation at the end of their own life are there because they did what they were told to do, which was to put caring for others ahead of their own needs. That's what they were trained to do. That was your job. You're a woman. You're a nurturer. That's your job. And so they did what they were taught. They were the good girls. They weren't stroppy me who said to my husband, sod you, I'm going to work. You know, well, my, you know, you mind the kids as much as I do. You had half of hand in it. And if I recall correctly, it was the fun half. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was the bad girl. They were the good girls who did what they were told. And they put their caring responsibilities first. And they, it was an absolute crock of shit. They were left high and dry. And now that they need our care, what's the neoliberal attitude to them? Clarence Thomas. Oh, you're a loser, welfare-dependent bludger. Get on that trampoline, honey. Jump your heart out. Mm. I just, I can't uh, begin to tell you how incandescent with rage I am about... The fact that these women were told, you look after us and we'll reward you by looking after you all your life. They lied. I think they've always lied about that. But often these women have, have actually been in the workforce. Oh, they've it's, all been in the it, workforce. But, but the, you know, at, at the essence of the neoliberal hope, the neoliberal idea, is that everybody should be self-sufficient economically. Everybody is a, a sociologist, um, and Olaf calls it the, um, the breadwinner, universal breadwinner regime. So mm. we're all meant to be breadwinners. Now, that's all very well, 
and many women enjoy being breadwinners. Mm. Many women enjoy um, careers and work and all of that. Of course. But the fact is, the planning, the thinking, never factored in uh, the nature of care. They never factored in, factored in the times when care actually becomes uh, all-consuming. A small infant, a very small child, breastfeeding, for example. It never factored in, factors in uh, when you decide to care for a parent with Alzheimer's. We have at the moment lots of scandals going on about, and rightly brought to our attention, as to what can happen in a nursing home, how bad they can be, these fragile old people mm. um, being treated in the most horrible way. But it's not just a matter of seeing this silo where care is not taken account of, uh, or this one, it's actually right across the board. Mm. Neoliberalism has a problem with care. And so you can't actually create a system where everybody is expected all of the time to be a breadwinner. There's actually something else here too. I'm sure all of you would have heard of the idea of a economic free rider. That means, um, as the Americans call them, the welfare queen, who is allegedly sitting back by, I don't know, the swimming pool, filing her nails. Um, Birthing cash, multiple children to get the single Cashing in the parents. enormous start check. But whatever the case, that though the idea is that that person is a parasite or is a, a free rider on the hard work of everybody else. But if you flip that on its head, the whole of the Australian nation is dependent upon women's unpaid labour. Not entirely women, because men actually, they're yeah. doing increasing proportion. Yeah, there is but some more men doing. female labour than anyone else. So just to give you an idea of the extraordinary... Um, wealth created by unpaid labour, um, it is more than 400 billion. Um, one estimate put it at just under half, about 43% um, percent of the value of GDP. But in all government decisions, in the way we think about it, it is as if these women, because it is not counted as part of GDP, and that's the measure by which we uh, do things, um, that they are doing nothing. So this mis mismeasurement of women's lives has a profound impact. It's not just that we missed the single mothers and didn't see what was happening. It's not just that we miss what is happening to older women. This is actually part of a systemic problem. Um, one very fine um, feminist economist, Marilyn Waring, who wrote um, a seminal book called Counting for Nothing, What Men Value and What Women Are Worth, published overseas in the, um, the uh, Northern Hemisphere as if women counted. Mm. But she calls it a system of applied patriarchy. Mm. Uh, she actually went to the, um, all the volumes which are held in New York of the system of um, accounts of the United Nations to work out why it was that women's labour wasn't counted. And she went through all the volumes um, and she found just one reference to it saying that it wasn't important. Mm -hmm. And when she, who had seen her grandmother and her mother and the women of her local community in New Zealand um, do so much essential labour for their families and the community, when she read that, she wept. Mm -hmm. um, but she then also wrote a really compelling account, um, a compelling account that's been taken up by um, the former French president, Nicolas um, Sarkozy, and he with Amartya Sen um, and um, Joseph Stiglitz and um, uh, an economist, Fatusi, a French economist, put together something very similar and said, actually, it has to be counted because mm -hmm. what we're doing is obliterating the contribution of families um, and of women and um, they need to be, um, to be counted. Uh, we've even stopped doing, since 2006, time use studies, mm -hmm. which can... If we have, for example, a moment, as we did with Christian Porter when he was then the social services minister, saying about um, young people who are caring for um, parents with a mental illness, um, that we they're going to spend, uh, going to force the um, taxpayer to support them to the tune um, of five hundred thousand over a lifetime. In fact, if the person who they are caring for on a daily basis, perhaps earning $8 a day, mm. is transferred to an institution, you're talking about 
$80,000 a year, mm. far more than over a lifetime. That's right. Um, so that the, the sense that these people are doing nothing um, has entered the lexicon, has entered um, the perception. Uh, it's extremely distorting, it's unjust, but also has these profound economic, yeah, yeah. economic consequences. Um, so about a third of women over the age of 65 are in, in income poverty, as mm -hmm. well as the rising group of homelessness. Uh, absolutely. And uh, everything they have done, all the things they did for others, have been taken for granted. I think um, y y I read your uh, essay about Marilyn Wherry and I included some of the things you wrote in there in the book. And what struck me was that uh, breastfeeding, for example, adds nothing to GDP. It's not counted as having any economic value at all, whereas formula adds, that's a great good tick. And I suddenly realised why Donald Trump had refused to endorse breastfeeding in the United Nations because it's not of any economic use whatsoever, apparently, um, although it does actually feed and sustain the next generation of taxpayers. I always do. I do like to point out that women have given birth to every taxpayer who's ever existed. Um, and that all, you know, it's funny how we begrudge women any, any of that actual tax in return. Um, but I don't want to be too generous, this will surprise you, to men in terms of their caring responsibilities, just because of a couple of shocking stats I've come across. The first is that women's uh, household labour, which includes childcare, um, all that kind of thing, has come down from the 1950s, where apparently it was about 77 hours a week, to an average now of 14.8 hours a week. And that's mainly to do with outsourcing and fewer children. So women have voted with their wombs and gone, I'm not having any more kids if it's this hard. And um, also to do, I think, with women getting a lot less picky um, about certain things. Who's dusted any time in the last 10 years? Certainly not me. <laughs> um, but uh, I think... The thing about that is, isn't that great, but men's domestic labour in the 60s was an average two hours a week. Marvellous. Um, it's doubled. <laughs> Four hours a week. Now, it's an average, okay? So that means that there are some men, like my fabulous husband, who are doing way more than four hours a week. But it means there's an awful lot of men who are doing absolutely nothing at all. And I, you know, I do think this idea of the breadwinner as being the only duty that's owed in terms of a, still a lot of men, this view that they bring, they bring home the bacon, that's, that's job done. They might deign to lift their feet while you hoover under it, perhaps. <laughs> If you bothered hoovering, I recommend against it. Um, so I don't want to be too kind. I think that's another problem we've, we've had, and maybe me too, just to go sort of bring those two strands together in a way. Maybe me too is having some effect on this. My view is I've watched my generation of women change beyond all expectation in terms of the kind of lives they've lived. And for a great many of us, as you mentioned, we've lived much richer, more exciting, more varied, more challenging, more interesting lives than um, any of the generation of women before us. A lot of that's to do with being able to control our own bodies, the pill and things like that, which gave us more choices about how we would juggle our lives. And I've seen women's attitudes to things change enormously too. What I haven't seen is men keep up with that change. Now, that doesn't mean all men. There are some fabulous men out there. Of course there are. But just in general, there's still a, quite a conventional attitude amongst a lot of guys about the way life goes and what their duties are and what their responsibilities are. And it's almost like me too has started to shift that. I think one of the things that it may have done is drop, and I think social media was starting to do this as well, trolls in a funny way, did as a weird kind of favour. Because once upon a time, 
Ah, it happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. I'm sure it's happened to a lot of women here. If you were in the workplace, some bloke might call you into his office and he would test strips off you and bully you and uh, say terrible things to you and put you down. And you'd come out and you'd say, oh, my God, you know, they just say X, Y, Z. People would go, you're exaggerating. Couldn't possibly be as bad as that. But it was as bad as that. Um, and so you, again, internalise it and thought, oh, maybe it was, maybe I overreacted. Um, now, of course, the men who would have done that get on social media and they do it in front of the world. They do that sexualised, insulting, uh, yeah, Alan Jones and Peter Vlandes to Louise Heron, you know, just in the last few days, that speaking down to, belittling, who do you think you are, not letting them get a word in edgewise. The absolute assumption that they are, you know, intrinsically know more about the world. A sense of entitlement. A sense of entitlement. And we're seeing that. And I think a lot of men of goodwill are having to see that as well. And I think Me Too has made a lot of men of goodwill go, holy shit. You spoke of Nina Fennell before. She does a wonderful exercise. She's, she does a lot of work with... <laughs> I'm not sure how well it's going. With the rugby league um, on helping them with their... Um, attitudes to women and trying to um, get rid of the terrible reputation that a lot of those players have. And one of the things she does with these young interns, they bring in the, 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 men, the young men with talent as rugby league players, is she runs an exercise where she asks them to put on the board everything they do to keep themselves safe from sex, every day to keep themselves safe from sexual assault. And all the young men go, oh, oh, what are you talking about? Nothing. And then she invites the women in the office to come in and she says to them, what do you do every day to keep yourself safe from sexual assault? And the women fill the board in a few minutes with, I walk down a dark street with my keys between my fingernails, you know, my fingers poking outwards. Um, I always check the back seat, you know, all those things Tani Plibersek talked about. Um, I check where I'm going and how far away the parking is. I double check all the locks if my husband's away. They fill the board in 10 minutes and the men are left with their mouths hanging open. Because what I think might be starting to happen, thanks to me too, is that men of goodwill are finally starting to see the world that women actually live in, that I think perhaps they were not aware of. And I'm hopeful, because we, we can't have half a revolution. You know, we talk about this as the unfinished, um, movement. We can't finish it until we actually bring the other half of the population, or at least a lot of them, along with us to recognise that there are enormous benefits in this for both men and women. Um, and we're not going to shift the disproportionate burden of care from women if we insist upon having in our economic system a care penalty for those who correct, because men won't won't I sign mean, up for what, it. What, why you? What, why do you think things will change if you have that embedded in the system? Exactly. Well, they yeah. won't until we women really. And I think what I like about the anger that's been unleashed um, by me too is I think that women are more powerful than they even know, and are beginning to access that power and we have to start insisting on it. And there is another thing that is occurring, and that is an enormous transfer of wealth. So we have this really weird dichotomy about older women where far too many older women are paying a huge um, price uh, for the lack of planning and the fact that we haven't factored care in as a, anything to do with, um, well, even being really real. Um, but there's also another group of more fortunate women, perhaps, who have not found themselves in that situation. And it's estimated there's something like $22 trillion about to be transferred in wealth from one generation to the next, and most of it is going to women. Now, the thing about that is, and these are women, because the other thing about the women over 55 is that they're the first generation, they're revolutionary, first generation ever in the history of the world to have mostly worked for their own, for their own, for money for most of their lives. And for some, that's giving them economic power. They're becoming a market for the first time, not spending the housekeeping, spending the money they've amassed themselves. So there's this weird kind of 
well, the inequality is within women as well as it is in the rest of society. But I have hopes that um, that economic power will start to have an impact on the way we value what women do across the board, not just their work, paid work, but all the work that women do. Mm. The, um, the caregiving that women give still predominantly do. And that it can be... Um, I, I think there's a very instructive campaign run by an international aid organisation on behalf of women where it's called Recognise, Reduce and Redistribute yeah. about care. So that the women did long lists of what they were doing and men realised it, but also uh, the women's self-esteem was raised, but they also felt uh, they could see, both the men and the women could see the unfairness of it. Um, the impact on their capacity to hold down a job um, was seen, and also that um, it had to be redistributed. Mm. So it's no good, for example, with um, older people, uh, someone with Alzheimer's, saying that it's lovely for them to age in their own home. Of course it is. But if you have, as a government, the um, provision of only four hours a week of care for someone um, who has uh, just a capacity to walk for a bathroom and walk to a table to eat, then that person will need 24-7 care the rest of the time. If that's not going to be an institution, who is it? It's usually, um, according to the figures, an adult daughter mm. um, who has to leave the workforce. So somehow this sort of this sense that there's this um, uh, a kind of terra nullius of... Of invisible that, women. That's right. There's an invisibility to mm. um, the work that women are doing and the kind of economic thinking needs to be uh, transformed from the mainstream and to actually integrate feminist economic thinking, um, which is uh, seeing all of these different elements and arguing uh, how the, the ways in which we might actually finish the unfinished revolution. Finish the unfinished revolution. Absolutely. And at that point, I think it's probably a good moment to open to questions. Made the complaints against him. Uh, that question, in case you didn't hear it, was what do we think of the backlash like Craig McLaughlin, who's now suing the women who made accusations against him? Uh, it's not surprising. Um, nobody gives up power without fight. a fight. And um, I think that men are going to use... Those men who have been predatory are going to use all the means at their disposal to make sure women shut up and go back into their box. And it will have an effect. Um, fortunately, I think to an extent that Me Too was never primarily about naming and shaming. Me Too, from, from why, where I looked at it, it was primarily about women realising that they weren't alone, that this was systemic and was a... Uh, almost, I'm afraid to use this word, normal experience for women throughout their lives, but particularly when they're younger, and that that solidarity is important in and of itself. There will be, and there already is, a really awful backlash, and women do need to think very carefully about what they're doing, but they always have. I mean, we've got to remember with Bill Cosby, for example, 60 women over decades told their story about Bill Cosby and they were very similar stories and they were just dismissed and, you know, he was acquitted, I think, at least once um, and only just now has he been convicted of drugging women into unconsciousness um, and then um, sexually assaulting them. So I don't know that it's all that different but the ante is being amped up because men feel so... Um, predatory men uh, are terrified. Thank you. We've got a question over on this side in the middle. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Ruth. Thank you very much for your time and intellect this evening. Um, on the topic of the unfinished revolution, given that this is a power struggle, will our revolution ever be finished? Ah, uh, good point. Uh, well, what I think is that 
although there's been all kinds of strides and progress, the sort of triumphalist rhetoric around um, women and uh, how much progress we've made and equality is in far, far in excess of what the reality is. So we really need to um, recognise where there are still great barriers and um, there does need to be not just, you know, we, we need to make sure that Me Too is not just a moment but a movement um, and is it translated into action. So, and, the, and ditto with the um, uh, question of care and older women, single mothers, uh, people with a child, child with a disability, all of that actually has to start become, you know, like me to um, uh, entering centre stage. And we need to have quite new... Sorry, I'm being attacked by a wasp. Um, it's Donald <laughs> Trump. Yeah. Cle <laughs> clearly sent by the forces mm. uh, of opposition. Mm. Uh, but there, I, I think it's a... These, there are moments in history where there is a kind of moral quickening you know, we suddenly become more sensitive to things that have been going on for a long time. Um, and in a way, because they are so commonplace, it's as if they're invisible to us. I can think of the way uh, people used to think about in, um, Indigenous Australians. I can think about um, the ways in which we um, uh, have been unaware for a long time about um, climate change. But there can be a moral quickening around an issue and this is a moment, it seems to me, of moral quickening. And in those moments, um, there is far greater possibility of pro for progress. Um, and it requires uh, a lot of um, common feeling, a lot of um, uh, uh, solidarity. It enables uh, women who are able to look across at others and see um, that their situation is actually very similar uh, and to be able to work out ways to act upon it. Do you want to add to that? Well, yeah, I, I love the idea of the moral quickening. I, I, in the book I've written, I, I think of a really clear example of how something changes all of a sudden and, and, and we were completely unaware of it. And my favourite example of how we just never even thought about what, how we were treating women and limiting what they could do is... Um, does everyone know the 7-Up series of films by Michael Apted. And in that very first series, which was made in 1964, they chose 14 uh, seven-year-olds in Britain, 10 boys and four girls. And that was because the attitude was nothing interesting ever happens to women. Their lives are the same, they're immutable. Their life is, is they, they marry someone and they have children. And if their life's interesting, it's because of who they marry, not because of who they are. And literally within well, by the time the next film was made, seven years later, that was clearly a crazy thing. And now you would no more choose ten boys and four girls than Flight of the Moon. I mean, the outcry would be extraordinary. You know, it would have to be even Stephen. So that was a moral quickening, I think, around then. And we were completely unaware of it, oblivious to it, to the discrimination. And so I think that will continue to happen. I suspect revolutions never really are finished. Um, there is always more work to be done. You hope the work becomes more manageable because I do think the problem for women is that it takes such an enormous amount of energy to push the patriarchy back. And then, you know, the minute you just kind of go, oh, look what we've achieved. And then you've got to get it. Whoa! And it, that's hard. It, it, it's hard work. So we all have to do it. And that's another thing I like about me too. What I do see changing now from when I was young is that so many more women are part of this and aware of this. When I was young and talking about inequality, most of the other women knew, thought I knew thought I was crazy. That doesn't happen anymore. That's a really good thing. The support of women for women is something I think that does help make that work easier. Thank you. Um down the front here, thank you. Oh. My name is Roz. Do you think that Germaine Greer has done uh, feminism and the Me Too movement a great disservice in her recent discussions around consent? And if you do think that, where do you imagine her thinking is at currently? Uh, no, I don't think that about Germaine Greer. I have a totally different view about Germaine Greer. I think that 
People like Germaine Greer and Mar Margaret Atwood and some of the older feminists in France who were critical of the Me Too movement, I don't agree with them, I think they're wrong. But that's okay, we don't all have to agree. Feminism is not a dogma. Uh, the fact that feminists disagree with one another is uh, the sign of a vigorous and dynamic movement. That is an excellent thing. As soon as we start all being in lockstep, we're in deep trouble. Then it's died. It's died. The thing about those women is, whether they agree with what's happening with Me Too, whether Jermaine Greer's views, which on consent I think are more nuanced than people have given her credit for, um, but nevertheless, whether you agree with her or disagree with her, me Too has only happened, not despite Margaret Atwood, Jermaine Greer and those other older feminists, but because of them. Because they took us to a point where this was possible. The older women who said things like, you know, oh, well, when we were at work, we just sucked it up and got on with it, and this generation of fragile, that's an unhelpful thing to say. It is, in fact, incredibly courageous to speak up about that behaviour which isn't to say that the older feminists lack courage, it's that the world hadn't changed enough for them to be able to speak up in the way that we can now. So it is not a good idea to write off our mothers and our grandmothers because they aren't where we are now. They got us to where we are now and we well, should be grateful. I slightly differ. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I think the... The problem of that is that uh, particularly younger women, but even someone of my age, may really take exception to some of the things she said. So um, on Q&A that um, a rapist is like a huntsman spider and uh, was just idiotic. Um, there have been numbers of, of statements which have diminished sexual assault. I like a lot of her work. Um, I've read it very closely. Uh, but I also, as well as disparaging our feminist foremothers, there can also be a kind of obedience or a sort of loyalty which is in excess of what they at this current moment warranting. Hmm. And so, wait, I haven't finished. Mm. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have not finished on the subject of Jermaine Greer. Um, <laughs> looking at her uh, comments, which is sort of sound bites, and I know she is an agent provocateur, I know that um, uh, she likes attention, so she's saying those things. But the fact is, if they're in the mouth of a man, we really react. So why are we so indulgent? So that's... Wait, I haven't finished. Okay. I thought you were asking me a question. <laughs> that, no, that's a rhetorical question. Oh, okay. The second um, a thing I would like to say before I finish um, is that it, her book on rape is actually a lot more nuanced. Mm. So I read that because I always like to do more than just read the sound bites. Um, I still can't forgive her for the comments she'd made about um, sexual assault because they're so insensitive to survivors of sexual assault. I cannot see that we have had a Royal Commission over five years making us more sensitised as to how we should speak and how we should relate to people who have been our adult survivors of child sexual assault. And here we are um, having a feminist speak in insensitive ways. But the book itself on rape... Um, has some really interesting points. For example, that uh, one sexual predator is likely to be guilty of, of a number of different crimes. This incredibly vexed problem of how you translate into law um, and conviction um, the uh, one word, his word against hers. Um, and actually, uh, what perhaps the most important uh, contribution, I wasn't there, but someone gave a, um, a, a very... Uh, interesting rendition of her speech here in Melbourne and um, what they said to me was that she was talking about um, sexuality, human sexuality in a really interesting way and we've been talking about the uh, horrors of sexual mm -hmm. abuse and sexual assault but there's another way of looking at it, which was the Liberation Project. And I'm old enough to remember what the Liberation Project was. And actually, I think there we should be able to listen to not only what she's saying, but this idea. And that's this. What are the, not just the negatives, what we don't want, but the human possibilities of um, tenderness, of eroticism, um, with tenderness, um, of respect, Mm. Um, and of intimacy, and somehow in 
the dating apps and in the hookups and in the ubiquitous sexual assault, um, in the social media pylons, that there's some, something that has gone out of that as a possibility. Yeah. There is a desolation in all of it. So, you know, I think that um, she's a thinker to be taken seriously, uh, but I don't like people's submission before her because she's a celebrity. I, I wouldn't disagree with anything you just said, um, but Jermaine has always said things that I thought were outrageous and outlandish. Um, and I disagree with a great deal of what she says. But I still think that all those women who did that work back then, don't have to agree with everything they say, but nor do you bow down in obedience or submission, but credit to them for getting us to where we are now. That's oh, yes. all I'd Agreed. say. Yeah. Agreed. But I also think you've got to allow younger women to come forward oh, and to course. find their How own voice. How could I voice stop them? And, yeah. to, and to actually get pretty angry with their mothers. <laughs> oh, well... <laughs> <laughs> and indeed they will. They will. That is the job of a daughter, to get and, angry with your mother. And we will continue... <laughs> and we, we mothers will wearily continue to love them, yeah. regardless. <laughs> going to pass here. We've got a young lady who's been waiting quite some time, so... Um, in terms of bringing men along with us um, in the revolution, uh, how much of that onus should be on women? Um, and how do we... Uh, how do we assure men that feminism is for them and for us and for everybody without actually adding to that labour um, <laughs> of women that we just discussed in terms of educating them and convincing them? Uh, male suicide in various... I don't know if anyone saw the reports of male suicide in the construction industry, which is very high. Mm. Um, then there was another report on the same night, I think, of um, a, a silicon lung disease... Um, uh, the, if you look at the fallout of certain sorts of male labour and if you look at um, a, lot, a lot of the, the, the stories on that particular night seem to be about the inexpressiveness mm -hmm. of men and the buttoning up of feeling um, and the inability to uh, do what women do in, in the way that they uh, often will share experience. You know, you sit, slide into the seat on a plane and you're um, over the second birth story by the time you've um, <laughs> hit the, um, the time you're plateauing. So there's something about the way we tell men to do being male that is hardly helpful. Uh, men themselves who are not at the top of the tree not the head honchos, but those who are at the bottom of the economic pile actually do it extremely tough. Mm -hmm. So I suppose what I'm saying is it seems to me they have a, a stake as well. But the other thing else I think is not actually up to individual women. It, we have had imposed upon us by the state the idea of the universal breadwinner. And a lot of the rhetoric and culture and um, uh, columnists um, screaming about lazy welfare mothers and all the rest of it has come from um, an ideology which is instituted by government and which um, serves business. So I think we could actually have leadership across the board, not on the usual, just, just the usual things of equal opportunity, but actually um, having um, what I call in my essay a universal caregiver state instead of the universal breadwinner. The idea that it is embedded in everyone's life, the obligation to find ways of caring for others and that it's an um, extremely positive thing to do. If you think that's pie in the sky, just think of the um, billions of dollars we all spend on pet ownership. Mm. Clearly, care is a part of the human being. And clearly, it is... Um, you know, men are, are, are as enthusiastic pet owners as women. So it's a lot to do just with the way we see and do gender. Um, and they have as much as a stake in it um, as, as we do. I always remember that when I was a child and if we went out for a walk as a family, my father would no more have pushed the stroller than flown to the moon. Men in the 50s and 60s did not push the stroller. Rarely held the hand, even, um, of a small child. Now, I see fathers out on a Saturday morning with a tiny little newborn in a... A, a, you know, a, a baby carrier while they've given their wife a sleep in on a Saturday morning. That fathering, which is the only way you have a relationship with a child is to do the work, 
um, that relationship between father and child is a direct gift to men from feminism. It's a direct gift to them. Those kinds of things can be emphasised. The thing about it is sometimes you will have lots of energy and you'll talk to some guy in a really reasonable way and you'll persuade him and other times you'll be really pissed off and you'll yell and scream and get assertive and slam the table and carry on and they're both fine. <laughs> you know? <laughs> We don't have to be reasonable all the time. We don't have to be persuasive all the time or nice or good and attractive and well-behaved all the time. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I've got time for one more question and I've got a uh, lady down the front here. As I said, we could go all week on this topic, I think. Yeah. Um, do you think that neoliberalism has hijacked sort of mainstream feminism in putting all the onus on leaving the house and paid work and women who choose to stay at home have been sort of forgotten and how can we combat that for people like me who has chose to stay home and raise my children to not be in the position that the forgotten women of today are in? Do you have any suggestions? I would just say that if, you, if my mother was here and she's 87 and she was at home with small children in the 50s and 60s, she would say to you, there was never a time when women at home were not forgotten and ignored. That's the myth the conservatives have told us that feminism forgot about women at home. Talking to women who were at home back then pre-feminism or current wave of feminism, they say, no, 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 no. We were as disrespected then as women at home are now. And you're absolutely right, we need to factor in, certainly superannuation should be paid to everyone who is, at, who is taking on caring responsibilities at any time in their life, male or female, whether it's small children, children with a disability, elderly parents, it doesn't matter who they're caring for. If they're taking on that responsibility, their super should be covered. Um, and I don't know how you calculate how much it is, but something should be done about that so that they don't end up with nothing when they're old. Um, obviously caring, and I mean, I think Anne's been talking about it as the universal caregiver model, where all of us would have an opportunity, men and women, to spend some time caring for um, whoever it is that needs care. And then I think we would find that care is valued. It is a truth, unfortunately, that whatever work women do um, seems to get undervalued. GPs, for example, when they were exclusively, almost exclusively male, was a high prestige occupation. Now GPs are mostly women. And guess what has happened to the status of being a general practitioner? So it isn't that you're staying home and, and caring for children necessarily that means you're low status. It's that you're, it's predominantly women who stay at home and look after small children that means it's lower status. And this is something to do with the way we organise hierarchy and status in a um, basically hierarchical society. But, but there is... Um, the questioner is right, in my view. Um, Neoliberalism has reshaped the way we interpret the feminist message. So that um, if you look back at the second wave feminists, there were all sorts of different voices about how to do things. But it is certainly true that coming out of compulsory housewifery, um, paid work was emphasised. But in reality, neoliberalism's got paid work for everyone as the agenda and it's to do with business interests and it's to do with the free market and it's to do with mm. a, a certain kind of ideology. But um, anyone in your position, if they are looking after small children, will feel, it seems to me, is likely to feel as if they've dropped off the edge of the world. I did it for five years. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I did it um, mm. for many years. So it's, uh, there is a way in which um, we are constructing women's life narratives and even well-intentioned and necessary things where we uh, have portraits of women who are successful in professions and who are um, doing all sorts of, of things um, are presented as the norm. So that can actually give women a sense of the effortless perfection that is expected of them um, to do both 
and that there is, um, you see, I would disagree with you a bit, I think there's a growing stigma around all forms of care. If you're not cutting it in the workplace, you're a flop. Um, and what I would say to you th is this, We've been talking quite a bit about, and, and joking and all the rest of it, about um, how dusting and housework and matter. But there's actually something both arduous and very difficult about care, but it is amongst the most meaningful work anyone will ever do. Um, I saw recently a scholar get up and talk about men who had taken the primary carer role, the stay-at-home dad role, um, I think in the 1970s. And the testimony was very moving. It was, they were going mad, they were felt totally uh, overwhelmed, they absolutely loved their children, they felt closer to them than they would have if they'd been um, blokes down at the local um, hardware or the mine. So that the, you know, the, the aspect of neoliberalism is always emphasising economic self-sufficiency also misses that we are human in the bonds that we form with each other and our, the deep kind of attachments, which is um, in such abundance with small children. Um, so there's a great pleasure in it, I suppose I'd say, as well as hard work and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's actually up to the rest of the society to care for the caregivers. And that's something I think has dropped away as well. Completely. The more we punish and shame and stigmatise people who are involved in care. When I speak, I have many women come up to me, younger women, older women, and they say, thank goodness you said that because I speak in a way that um, doesn't marginalise them or have a narrative which excludes them. Maybe they're uh, an older woman who has a child with a mental illness, an adult child, and they've gone out of the workforce to look after them and they really miss their job, but that's what they're doing. Or perhaps they have a parent with Alzheimer's or they're a young mother with, with small children. So there's a way in which we need to really push back, not just at the patriarchy, but actually at these noxious ways of thinking which diminish every human being and to recognise that when people are doing care, they need economic looking after, but they also need kind of soul food. They need to be cared for and respected mm. and nourished by the respect that we give them. Mm. It's Hillary Clinton's thing, isn't it? <laughs> it, it takes a village, yeah. wasn't it, what Hillary Clinton said? And I think that's right. What we do is we dump care on one person and we say, right, that's your job. And it's often 24-7, mm. you know... 365 days a year, which is a job, it doesn't matter what the job was, no one can do that. No one can do that. I think one of the great ironies is the, uh, the care professions are also gendered Total and, oh. and the lowest paid. You've lowest just reminded paid. me of something. We have a, we have a, also, we have this schizophrenic view of women in care. So you're absolutely right. Neoliberalism doesn't value it in one way. It, um, it says, you know, the career woman, the go-ahead, women on boards, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, there's, a, there's a, 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 an organisation near where I live and they have a slide in the cinema and every time I see it, it's just the name of their organisation. It hits me like a slap and it's called Dutiful Daughters. And it's a home care organisation. So there's this uh, dismissal of the duty of care and, and, and sneering at it, but there's also this... Um, elevation and this um, commercialisation. commercialisation, but also this slap, you know, because if do duty daughters were really doing their duty, there'd be no need for the organisation called Dutiful Daughters. So it's, it's, it's like we're caught in this cleft stick where we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. So on that note, I think our, um, our upcoming... Sorry. Our upcoming Ideas in Society event, um, which is uh, very much focused on social justice in the neoliberal age, might be something that you might all like to come along to and feel free to come along yourselves. So that'll be presented by Dr Cassandra Goldie and Father Frank Brennan on the 14th of November. And uh, we really encourage you to come along to that because these, these topics, the co topics we've covered today and the others that we've covered in Ideas in Society, this is our society and we've got the opportunity to shape it. 
and debating ideas and, and talking about these issues is really critical um, and that's why La Trobe University um, is involved and really keen to promote this kind of thing. So I wonder if you can join with me in thanking Anne and Jane uh, for their fabulous uh, <laughs> gift this afternoon.